House of Strauss. We are joined by Larry Kruger, Bay Area radio legend turned YouTube sensation. And I mean, look, I know that my audience, if you're listening right now, a lot of you like the media analysis and maybe you're not so into the football or perhaps more accurately, you don't regard myself as an expert on football like Larry is. Uh, I think the way we're going to do this, Larry, is that we're going to talk about some of the media stuff and maybe hit some 49er stuff down the road of the podcast. Make producer Anthony Mays happy and all the 49ers heads out there happy. But, you know, I, I got to say, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit worried, Larry. I'm worried because, Uh-oh. well, you're such a hard worker and what you have done has been incredible. Congrats on the 40,000 subscribers, by the way. Thank you. But I've, I, I've never seen you be particularly introspective about this saga of yours that I find so remarkable. And so in my head right now, I'm going, how do I, how do I coax this out of Larry? How do I coax this out of a guy who is so laser focused on the Niners and some other teams in the area and who they might draft in the third round to take a step back and talk about this incredible journey from getting shoved out of K and BR to open it up your own shop and become in such a sensation. Can you be introspective, Larry? Is it possible? Yes, I can. I can. Um, I can be incredibly introspective for a price. No, no, oh, no. No, 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 I'm just joking. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I, I, this is my favorite topic to talk about other than the Niners and the Giants and the Warriors um, is, is this channel, which has been my singular focus for two years now. Um, we're coming up. This is, <clears throat> excuse me, right now, the official two year uh, anniversary of this channel. We started this channel on like March the 1st of 2022, and it's now it's the 6th of uh, 2024. So we're almost at the exact two year point. And, you know, Ethan, it's interesting. You know, there's a lot of people, right, that you, come in contact with. Um, And some of them are old friends. Some are new. Some are from people that you met on the radio. Some are people that I met when I scouted football players years and years ago. And then some go all the way back to high school. And um, I went to St. Ignatius High School in the city. And um, a guy who was one of my friends in high school was the, who's also done incredibly well for himself is the great Al Madrigal, um, the comedian who's been on Mm. the daily show and he's now a major motion movie star and does a lot of things. He's a stand-up comedian and he's a good friend of mine. I would think I was a senior when I was a sophomore. I don't think he had a car. I, so we'd get to these parties in Marin County and he'd be like, Hey crew, can you give me a ride home? And I'd be like, yeah, where do you live? He's like, Oh, you know, I live in the city. No sweat. I'll drive you home. So we became kind of friends, even though we were different years in high school and then became continued being friends afterwards. Well, when KMBR decided that they could no longer afford to pay this guy, um, you know, a bunch of people reached out. And one of the guys that I reached out to on my end, because I respect him so much, is my good friend, Al Madrigal. And I said, Al, come on, man, you're a major motion picture a uh, guy, your daily show, you're a comedian. You've started all things comedy with Bill Burr. You've done some amazing things. Give me your perspective on where I'm at. You know exactly where I'm at and what I'm doing and what my skill set is. And and he's like, well, I can't really tell you what you should do, but what I what I what I would tell you is a do not spend one day walking around perfecting the why KMBR <laughs> fired Larry Kruger <laughs> story or, or why KMBR, de- you know, uh, laid off Larry Kruger story and just pour yourself into something that you think is viable for and give it two years and then see where you're at in two years. And literally, that's where we're at today. So in, in some ways, Ethan, I, I really find it interesting that you're asking me to be introspective because you're right. I don't spend a lot of time on my show or my channel doing the, oh, this is how it all happened story. Um, I I really just try to provide content for the Warrior fan, Niner fan, Giant fan, 
uh, football fan, draft fan. Um, and I don't focus a lot on the story, but he, you know, Al told me, don't perfect your how you got let go story. Put everything you got into some path that you think is viable and reevaluate in two years. So I think in, in some ways it's cathartic that you're asking me about this today. Well, I'm glad that you can have that catharsis. And I've noticed that you want to keep it forward because Damon more recently, Damon Bruce got forced out of radio and has found success on YouTube and is doing these, these streams with you. And so I feel like Damon is a little bit more introspective about it. And I've seen on occasion, you guys even talked about 40,000. I felt like he was trying to coax a little bit more out of you when it comes to this topic. Um, and I guess it's just been your lodestar by way of Al Madrigal to just move forward and continue to serve up the content and not reflect. But it's to me, it's a remarkable story. It's an inspiring story because I've seen guys in radio eventually get forced out and it's a dark thing it's a, the end of the line for them and i'm wondering when that happened and you were with tolbert and when you were as you said downsized did you wonder if this was going to be it for you and this was the end or did you just not think about that no i, n I never thought that that would be it for me um you know mm -hmm. i i can do this at a high level and get big ratings and um, I could do it again for KMBR. I could do it full time for 95.7 The Game. Uh, 95.7 The Game, you know, came to me almost immediately after being let go and said, hey, man, we want you. Um, but we don't, we, you know, our contracts do not align. We didn't know you were going to be available. Our contracts don't align with you. Um, and so they're like, hey, next time there's an availability, we, um, we want you. And that came up in March when they let go of Damon and Ratto and that whole uprising. And I was going to be a full-time guy at 95.7, but we couldn't agree on who would own the Krug show. And mm. I insisted that I remain the owner of the Krug show. And, um, and for whatever reason, that was kind of a deal breaker to the parent company people over at 95.7. Uh, they wanted to own the Krug show. And at that <laughs> point, the Krug show was making about five to $7,000 a month. And which seemed like a lot of money to me at the time, even though in radio, I was probably making 10 to $15,000 a month. But, mm. um, but I just said, no, I just said, no, I, I don't want to give you the um, control over the, I was willing to share some of the revenue but I didn't want to give control of the channel and decide, have somebody tell me when I can stream, who I can stream with, what I can stream about, how it fits the radio station's vision and this and that. I just was like, no, I'm not doing that. And I'll give Matt Nahagian credit over at 95.7. He's like, we still love you. We want you. You know, how about you, uh, you know, work part time for us and do our uh our 49er pregame show with Lo Neal and, and, you know, continue to work on our station and you'll just continue to own your channel and we'll just go forward status quo. And I'm like, great, you know, so that's where we're at. Um, so I could have given them the channel and been back there full time as of last March. And I just, I just saw where radio is and was and where it's going. And I've, I've been, I was pushing KMBR for the two years prior to uh, when I was let go in 2022 to move to YouTube and to, I was, I was lecturing the, the program director on, dude, what are you doing? You know, you're getting mm -hmm. beat by 95, seven in the youngest demographic. They're on YouTube. They're on Twitch. You're on AM radio. Do you understand what's happening to you right now? And he was yeah. going through some medical issues and he was going through some other things and budget cuts. And I don't know. I mean, I kept getting excuses. Oh, well, this person doesn't want cameras in their house. And this person, I'm like, dude, none of that should matter. Get on, you know, the audience is migrating, whether you're going to migrate with them or not. Uh, get on YouTube, get on Twitch, go where your audience is and, and fight. You know, I mean, yeah. you've got a good product, KMBR. Go put it out there on Twitter and go put it out there on YouTube and go put it out there on Twitch and go. It's not just one bucket where everybody's sitting. It's now that bucket's broken up and there's 20 buckets 
Go solicit your fans in all 20 buckets every single day. And the guy didn't get it. And, and it cost him his job. Um, unfortunately, it cost me my job too. <laughs> so, uh, so, but I, I told him like from 2020 on, you know, I had a buddy who was, who was doing really well in YouTube and was marketing MMA fighters. And, and he was kind of showing me the way of the future in 2018, 2019, 2020. By 2020, I was totally sold. And so I was like, hey, let's do this. Let's take this AM radio station. Let's make it YouTube. Let's make it everything. And I was given a me or tons of excuses why, why it's a great idea, but why it's not right for us right now. And um, in a way, I felt like Cambiar did me a favor when they they signed a bad deal with the Giants. They were upside down by five million dollars. I was making two hundred fifty grand a year, um, as was probably Brooks. And it was just easy to be like, "Hey, let's save five hundred grand and hire somebody and who's making fifty grand and pay him a hundred and and we'll save all that money." And you know, since then, there's been other guys who are really talented, maybe more talented than me, who are offloaded. Paulie Mack and FP Santangelo and, you know, and there'll be more people offloaded in the future in radio because the revenue pie is just shrinking and they need not corporate America and they don't need mom and pop. They need that in between, uh, you know, company like, a, you know, sleep train was big for years there. Mm. It's now a mattress firm. Um, you know, and they, they're looking for that kind of mid tier advertiser and that mid tier advertiser is disappearing. So, and then their audience has now migrated, um, to, to YouTube and other spots. Yep. And I give Adam Copeland a lot of credit because he came in as the new program director recently. And what did he do? He just basically did exactly what I was telling, um, the program director to do before he's made them more of a media company that is on the radio as far as a radio station that dabbles in these other, these other media uh, outlets. So I think that's smart and it's way behind schedule. And that's why they're still, they're getting beat every book by 95, seven, the game. Yeah. <laughs> Partially because Matt Nahagian really is a great program director and understands you know, how to, you know, you got to play the hits militantly. You got to stay on the clock militantly. You can't have this kind of like laid back. We're talking about milk. We're talking about cookies. We're talking about, you know, scratching our itch. And no, you can't do that. You got to talk Niners, Giants, Warriors, and provide a lot of content with some intensity. And then you got to put your content with that intensity in all these different buckets and tell people you're there and keep intriguing them and soliciting them for, to come to your station, to come to your YouTube, to come to your IG, to come to your TikTok, to come to, and then guess what? Then they fall in love or don't with your product and they start dabbling. Maybe they're a TikTok. They entered your portal through the TikTok portal, yeah. but now they're listening five days a week on the radio, driving to their new job. They entered your world through IG, but now they're locked into your YouTube. I mean, you just got to view the, 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 you know, the, the listener of today as a listener, a viewer. Um, it's just a person out there who's digesting content in all these different realms. And today they may be big on YouTube, but six months from now, they may be big on radio. And 10 months after that, they may be big on TikTok. And that's kind of the way it is. And if you're in every porthole saying, we got great content, listen to us, listen to us, listen to us, you got a shot. If you're not, you're dead. Man, um, yeah, you've thought this through. I should not be surprised that you have. I'm so glad you touched on the 95.7 being forward thinking on YouTube. I am, I don't know, maybe other radio stations do this, but I was intrigued. And it's so simple, but it's interesting to me. When you see clips of them talking on YouTube, they color code it according to the team they're discussing. It's almost like this evolution of the PTI scroll that indicates what's going to be discussed on television that the YouTube clips of a 95-7 segment, blue for the Warriors, red for the Niners, orange for the Giants. Now, maybe you could argue that's not that big a deal, but as somebody... I do the same thing. Let's talk Warriors. 
Oh, <laughs> look at that right there. Oh, Giants. Oh, oh. oh. <laughs> We're back to Niners. Ooh, and at night it's a little bit. It's a little when I when I don't have as much gnat light coming in. It really makes the studio look red. It really makes the studio look blue. I did a Warrior <laughs> live stream the other night after the game. I had six other guys in the room. I made it blue. So I mean, it's like you. It, it does kind of. It's for it, it's for ease of scroll. So it makes it easier for the person scrolling to discern what the video is about and. People have gotten used to it. It's like we all used to want to listen to a, a um, podcast. Now we want it time coded. We want it to be tell tell me what Ethan's talking about when Ethan's talking about it, so I can go right to it. Um, yeah. and that's a big thing now. So it's you know it's just it's you just you're trying to make it as easy as you're as user friendly as possible. And I could certainly invest in more of that on my end, but I sometimes I always worry about optimizing too much and bandwidth of what a you know whatever else I'm doing. But, but yeah, maybe maybe I could stand to do more of that. I'm intrigued because you mentioned playing the hits on radio. Yeah, I don't think you necessarily play the hits, but it becomes a hit to me. You are so granular with your Niners analysis. I mean, this is what is kind of really took me in and impressed impressed me was that you're coming up with sleepers who aren't even on the mock draft boards guys who played in colleges I've never heard of who were basketball players but showed something that maybe they're the next Antonio Gates like you go you go deep so has that been an evolution for you was that an issue when you were on radio and you felt a pressure to play the hits and now you're liberated to just get as granular as you might want to be, or am I overanalyzing it? And you just talk about whatever's interesting and you've just been doing that forever. Well, you know, it's funny. It, it all goes back to how I got into this. I mean, so I went to Sac state. Uh, I didn't play football at Sac state, but a guy who did play uh, a guy who's was in my fraternity in Sac state. Dad was the head coach of the football team. And I was over at his son's house watching football and he heard us talking ball and he came in and he's like, Hey, you really, you really know your stuff. And I said, well, thank you. I played a little high school football and I, and I'm, I'm, I've read a lot of books. I've read uh, Bill Walsh's book on organizational football. And, you know, mm -hmm. I have a lot of passion for it and this and that. And, uh, you know, I follow the draft. I mean, that was following the draft like in 1987, you know I mean? It's, it's kind of yeah. 1986. I mean, really way, way back. So he's like, Hey, um, I'd love you to come help me do some recruiting at Sac State. And I might be able to even, you can take my coaching a football class and I can give you some extra units and this and that. So I took his class and I, and his final project was give me your organizational plan. And, you know, most people in this class were football players and they did their five to nine page deal and handed it in. Well, I just was super into it. I just read Walsh's book. I did like a 28 page paper. He gave me an A and then at the end of the semester, he's like, hey, I'm leaving Sac State football after 27 years and I'm going to the Canadian Football League. And I'm like, oh, Bob, way to go. Um, mm. This is the late, great Bob Matos who coached at Sac State for years. And he said, hey, you're coming with me. And I said, what? I go, I don't know Canadian <laughs> football. And he's like, yeah, but, you know, it's an NFL staff. You want to work in the NFL, right? I said, yeah, I'd love to work in the NFL. Uh, he's like, it's a total NFL staff. Kay Stevenson, the former head coach of the Buffalo Bills, the head coach, all the coaches and scouts and personnel people will all be NFL people. If you want, it's going to be right here in Sacramento. We can't pay you hardly anything, like 18, 19 grand. You're going to have to work 100 hours a week or more. It's going to be pretty thankless, but you're going to build up awesome connections, and these guys are going to fall in love with you or they're going to hate you because you're going to spend tons of hours with them. And I said, great. So, I did that. I worked my butt off. I told my dad, I said, Hey, you know, I'm, I got this opportunity. I'm going to be working 120 hour weeks for like 18 grand. And he's like, Oh, he's like, well, I'll help you. I'll help you. I'll give you our, you know, gas card. I'll throw you a couple extra bucks every month for your rent and I'll help you make ends meet. If you promise me, you'll put everything you got into this because this is your shot. And I'm like, okay, I promise. So I worked hundred hour weeks. It was an NFL staff at the end of the year. Four of those guys went to different NFL teams. One of them became the general manager of the Arizona Cardinals. He took me with him as a West Coast scout. And so this is in the 90s, mid-90s. I'm scouting for the Cardinals. Buddy Ryan was the head coach. Joe Woolley was the general manager. 
Uh, the free agency had just begun around the NFL. They needed pro personnel people. So I was doing a lot of pro personnel evaluation and bird dogging. And to basically what that is, is just they'd tell me what stadium to go to, what players to look at, what reports to write. And then I would write reports. We would have meetings, conference calls, that kind of thing. So I worked for Keith Kidd and Joe Woolley, and this was the mid-90s, and I just stumbled into the radio. And so as like a part-time thing, I just, I, you know, through Sports Byline USA Radio Network. And so my first passion has always been to be a football scout, and that's the track that I was on. And the only real reason I didn't pursue it fully away from radio is I met my wife right then, and suddenly I didn't want to be on the road 35 weeks a year. Yeah. And I'm one of four kids and I came from a very tight knit family. And I can, when I'm planning my life, it's like, I knew I wanted to get married and have, you know, a, a whole house full of kids. I didn't know if I wanted to be a football scout or a radio guy or mm. what I wanted to do. So I knew she was the one I knew I didn't want to travel the globe or travel the country and be gone. I didn't think it would work out if I did. Uh, you know, it was like an early relationship. And so I just chose radio over scouting. And um, because radio allowed me to stay in San Francisco and the hours were great. I still loved it. Um, but I didn't have to be on the week, on the road 36 weeks a year. So that's but so. So basically, I've always been a frustrated football scout doing a mm -hmm. radio show. So that's kind of where my personnel granular stuff comes from. I don't get that granular. Well, I do get pretty granular on the NBA draft, believe it or not. Bill Duffy's a good friend of mine. And when I mm. see him at Little League Games in Walnut Creek, I'm always talking his ear off about international players he's representing and sophomores in high school. And so I'm big on the, you know, the NBA granular thing, too. I used to be a little bit more on the baseball side. Now it's more major league. But yeah, it was, it was a challenge because some of the... I wanted to make money on radio and the money slots were drive time. And yet my style was made for what we call the P1s, which is the nighttime crowd. And that's where you make the least money. And it was fine when I was coming up. And then credit Tony Salvador, he paid me six figures to do the nighttime show because he saw that, um, you know, I could do it at a high level and retain some of that audience for the morning show, which is that's what the nighttime show is about. You're trying to make sure when people turn off the radio that when Murph and Mac or Murph and whoever get in their car, or Bonte and Shasky, whoever it is, that it's the station's on 95.7. Well, how do you make it on 95.7? You make them turn off 95.7 last in the night. So the mm. nighttime affects the morning ratings. Interesting. So Salvador understood that. And he told me, he's like, hey, look, my biggest audience is morning drive. My second biggest audience is afternoon drive. My third biggest audience is after Giants games. And you are the best after Giants games. And um, and that's why he used to say that to Radnich. And that's why Radnich used to say that all the time on the radio. Oh, this is the best guy after Giants games. Because Salvador would say that to Gary. And Gary would repeat that because he was friends with Salvador and wanted to you know, make him happy. So that's basically how it all happened. I, I was at night forever. Um, and then, um, you know, I was doing the nighttime thing when the whole Felipe Alou thing happened. And that was a gigantic misunderstanding and was totally misrepresented. But it led me down a path that took me to KGO, which took me to Mad Dog Radio on Sirius XM 2011, 95.7 comes to existence. Larry, for those who don't know, is referring to getting canceled pre-social media, which was, uh, right. you know, like that was back in the day. And, you know, sorry, I was just it, yeah. we, don't have to dwell, we don't have to dwell on it, but giving some context to the listener who might not know. But you were saying, uh, sorry for interrupting. Well, no, no, not at all. So then I'm at Mad Dog Radio and I'm doing that. They're just starting off and I'm doing their overtime show from 10 p.m. to 3 a.m., which was a grind, especially since it was like, 55 minutes an hour there were no commercials so it was like really all night just talking 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 very tough gig uh eventually came back to kmbr in 2011 when 95.7 came into the marketplace and they realized hey man i'm gonna be on you can either have me on your channel opposite them or you can have me on their channel opposite you but i'm gonna be on and um lee hammer and and the powers that be at kmbr at that point tony had moved on but um, said, hey, yeah, come work for us. 
They gave Damon Bruce like a one week trial with Gary. It didn't work out. Damon, I think, thought he was taking over for Gary. Gary had no interest in leaving. He didn't want anybody, you know, taking over for him. So that they didn't jive. Um, it was explained to me that, you know, Gary just wants, you know, they, they want someone to talk more sports around Gary, but they want Gary to still be Gary. And so I told him, I, we went to lunch and we got together and they said, Hey, you know, can you work with Gary? Can Gary work with you? Um, and I said, absolutely. I can work with Gary. I love Gary. And, um, so we worked together, me giving kind of the granular part of it, him giving the, you know, the casual observer part of it. We were number one for, you know, 12 years or 10 years. Um, you know, in there, the Giants won the World Series in 10, 12, and 14. That obviously helped our ratings. Um, and I was there with him until they added Greg Papa and moved Gary out in uh, 2019, I believe. And then I joined Tolbert and Brooks. Um, and that was through the pandemic. We, we did a whole year of the show from our homes. That was crazy. Um, and then, uh, KMBR got 10, you know, bid $10 million on the, uh, Giants rights. They had sold $5 million. They were in a $5 million plus hole and I was making good money and they downsized me. Um, and at that point, I knew exactly since I'd been complaining to KMBR, join YouTube, join YouTube. I knew exactly that I was going to, join YouTube. So, I mean, literally the next day I'm buying the cameras, the lighting, the computer, all of it, setting up my studio, which was in my home, uh, built by Mad Dog Radio and Sirius XM years earlier. Um, and I just, it was a radio studio. And now I just transitioned it to a television studio or a YouTube studio. And so I just went on literally two days after they said, you know what? You're out. I said, well, no, I'm not out. I'm over here. And, mm. um, and here it is two years later and 40,000 people have joined me and, um, I've got, you know, five sponsors. I've got some major new sponsors coming. Um, I'm doing the kind of content I love to do. I'm talking about what I want to talk about with who I want to talk about it with when I want to talk about it. I've, I've got sponsors who have paid for trips to spring training and Super Bowl and, um, I'm, you know, I've, I've gone on with all these other content creators. Grant Cohn helped me dramatically. Dave Lombardi. Now I'm helping Damon Bruce get his channel going. Um, I really think it's the wave of the future and I, I love it. And then my son, after one year of me working on it with a buddy, my son came over and said, dad, I think I can do some great things for you. He then started taking my longer streams, cutting them into videos, which just piled up you know, thousands and thousands and millions of views. And it's become much more of a financial uh, bonanza here in year two than it was in year one. Year one, I wasn't making very good money. Uh, maybe a couple thousand dollars a month. Nothing great. Um, now I've almost entirely replaced my entire um, radio salary. And um, the future is incredibly bright. So I... I, I love it. And um, and now I've, I have four kids. Ethan, my my third child is a varsity baseball player for Northgate High School in Walnut Creek. Um, I'm coaching my 14-year-old's juniors team. And so, like, I can do that. I can do this around that. I, I'm a season ticket yeah. holder at Northgate Baseball. I mean, I'm there every single game, all game. And I stream before and I stream after. And uh, I'm coaching the team for my 14 year old and I stream before and I stream after. Mm. And I don't, you know, I, I still fill in on 95, seven, the game, but only when I really want to. Um, and I still do their pregame on the, on the football side on, uh, from the Santa Clara Hilton with low Neal. And I love doing that. And I've done some stuff working for the 49ers as well as they've grown, their brand to London and Mexico city. I've kind of been a part of that. Um, I've done some work for them and I plan on doing more for them next year. So it's been great, man. I, I absolutely love it. And then I'll tell you what I really love. I love the power of this, this phone and this camera. <laughs> you know, it's amazing. This camera on the latest iPhone is almost like a movie, movie studio, a traveling movie studio. 
And I'll go down to 49ers complex, sit in the middle of their presser. I can ask Kyle Shanahan a question. My son can literally edit it so that it's like I'm just doing a one-on-one interview with Kyle Shanahan. There's like nobody Mm. else in the room. And you can put that content out. It gets huge views. Then I'll go into the locker room. I'll talk to the players. I got a great rapport with a lot of them because I'm not trying to do the gotcha questions. I usually, most of my interviews start with, hey, what's up, bro? Where are you from? You know, um, yeah. just like real, just like dudes being dudes, right? And um, I love it. I absolutely love it. I mean, I've gotten deep with Kinlaw, with Drake Jackson, with Aaron Banks, with Dre Greenlaw, with Brock Purdy, with Debo Samuel, with, you know, Ray Ray McLeod, with, you know, and I'm bringing that content like literally face to face in high, you know, you know, really good camera quality right to the audience. And then I don't try to interview Kittle and Debo yeah. and Purdy. I'll go up to John Feliciano and talk to him about 15 minutes about his traditions and how he celebrates Christmas. Is it Christmas day? Is it Christmas morning? What did you get your kids? You know, what's your favorite? F- I talk steaks with Colton McKivitz. Um, hmm. And it's just like, it starts to just be like, it's fun. And then I got a good rapport with these guys. I mean, I, you know, I feel like I walk into that room. Uh, those guys know a, I know my football B, you know, I'm going to grind. Like I went up to Randy Gregory. I started asking him questions this year about something. And he's like, dude, and he, I, he's only been here for like three weeks at the time. He's like, dude, you know, your shit. And I'm like, That's insane. I'm like, well, you know what? I know my shit because I I'm, I don't want to come in here and ask you guys questions and be that guy that doesn't know anything. And since I worked in pro football, I do know my shit from I know my I know what process a pro football player goes through to prepare to play, whether it be Sunday, Monday, whatever day. And so I can talk to them more about their process and get in their world a little bit more better than I think the average media person. And that's really all I'm bringing to the table. And I'm just, and that my enthusiasm and my son's ability to edit it and put it in every porthole there is to the audience. Um, And I love it, man. I absolutely love it. And then talking to guys like yourself, I mean, I love I loved your coverage of the Warriors. I loved the way you and Durant would sometimes have some <laughs> back and forths and you would challenge him and he would challenge you. And I, I love people like I love like a Kawakami. He goes after it. I love Grant Cohn. Why? Because he goes after it. Now I don't agree uh with ev- with everything Tim says, and I don't agree with everything Grant says, but that's secondary. I like media people that aren't there for the free hot dog. I like people that are there who are like, damn, I'm going to ask a tough question. I'm here. Or damn, I'm going to, I'm going to ask a probing question. It's going to be a tough question. Maybe it's just a probing question. I love to think, and I love people who draw um, that intellectual curiosity out of me. And um, hopefully that's what I'm drawing. That's what people like other people in the media that will come and say, I like your stuff. A lot of times when we talk about it after 15 minutes, it's like, you just like the fact that I'm intellectually curious because then you're living vicariously through me and you're mm. learning something. And it's like, you know what? That's what, that's what I want to be. I want to learn through Ethan Strauss. I want to learn through Jesse Naylor. I want to learn through Grant Cohn, Dave Lombardi, Damon Bruce, um, talking to the players, talking to the coaches. Um, so that that's kind of where it's been at. And it's like, it's enabled me to, because I don't have that connection with the teams with the rights holder fees. You know, some of the, some of the coverage gets a little soft because it's like, I don't want to, I don't want to ask Farhan a tough question because Mm. you know what? We're carrying all the games or I don't want to ask Shanahan a tough question because what if he gets mad? Uh, I don't want to ask her a tough question. You know, it's like, I'd rather ask those tough questions and ask them diplomatically and then not try to trap, trap people. I don't, I don't believe in like verbal entrapment. So it's like, I'm going to ask you the toughest question I can ask you. You give me the best answer you can. I'm not going to then try to parse your words back to you and trap you or, you know, start one of my, I never start with, 
On the 27th, you said this. I mean, it's like, you know what I mean? I don't like that. And nobody wants to be trapped by their words. So I try to ask tough questions and I try to get good answers. And then I don't do a lot of follow up. I'm going to nail you to, you know, to it. Um, I try to be a little bit more just like cool about it. Like, hey, you know what? You don't want to talk about it. Fine. You know, and then and then, and then I don't want anybody on the show who doesn't want to be on the show. So like that whole day, like if I go up to somebody and like, hey, man, you got time there. Like, I don't really want to do it. No sweat. You know, yeah. no problem, man. God bless you. Uh, we'll see you around. Good luck to you. I mean, I don't care. It's like I don't want to force people onto my show. I want people to see. I like walking through the locker room and have guys go, dude, I love that video last night. And then I'll be like, hey, man, you want to talk? Yeah, let's talk later. I can't talk right now, but tomorrow after practice. And then it's like, that's now when, as soon as you sit down, it's like, you know, that's going to be a good conversation because that person's watched your stuff, knows what you're about. You know what I mean? So that's kind of where I know I just went off on a verbal tirade there, but basically that's my, my, my uh, explanation of where I'm at. Well, you said a lot and it presents the challenge to me of not even quite because I could just there's so many threads I could go with there. For instance, Grant Cohen. Anything, yeah. I, Anything. I, I don't necessarily I'm not as critical of Shanahan as he is. And he is a bit of a provocateur, but provo uh, pr provocation leads to insights. It leads to content. So I appreciate that Grant is going to be in that press conference and he's going to ask Shanahan something that will piss him off. And I, I don't think that that's a useless activity. It, it gives you a little bit of an insight into what Shanahan is thinking or what he's defensive about, um, because that's a guy who is a little bit hard to read. He's not like Steve Kerr. He's not cuddly. There's a bit of a there's a bit of a mystery there. So I, I think Grant's career is really interesting to me um, and how he's built his persona and. He also just works tremendously hard as you do. But on the thing you were he talking about, me. Was, he helped me a ton. Like I went to him. Not only did I go to uh, to uh, Al Madrigal, I went to Grant and I said, man, you're killing it. I'm seeing you absolutely kill it. Can we go to lunch and talk about it? And I took him to lunch at a place in Walnut Creek and we just talked it over. And, and he's like, dude, I think you're good. I think you got good content. Um, this is what I do. This is how I'm doing it. And he showed me. And I've followed that, you know, I mean, we're different with different takes, but I followed that kind of approach that he showed me and I love him for it, man. I mean, um, and I, in some ways, I mean, right now, I think we're kind of on the outs because I kind of, I, I, I kind of bashed him a little bit um, when he and Lowell were talking about firing Shanahan. I just think that's so tired to keep going down this fire Shanahan every time they, they don't, they don't win. Uh, so we haven't streamed in a couple of weeks, but we'll we'll figure it out at some point. But I, I just love the guy for how much he helped me and kind of threw me a lifeline and was like, hey, you know what? I'm doing this and you could do this and I can help you. And this is how. And I mean, I w really wouldn't be here with this channel without consulting with him first about not just the channel, but like how to grow it. Hmm. Uh, well, I I can't believe or it, it would be hard for me to believe that grant is that sensitive i'm sure you guys will patch things up it gets we'll, rough we'll it gets it, it gets rough sometimes you had uh the coach on i don't even know his name but he is a very uh captivating youtuber on the subject of the niners you guys had this just crazy kind of knockdown drag out fight over the pivotal play of overtime in the super bowl and whose fault it was. If it was uh, Burford's fault, the young offensive lineman for missing the assignment, or if it was Shanahan's fault for having too complex a protection. Did you guys, is that a situation? Because you guys were really going after it for, in my memory, about 10 minutes. Did you afterwards have a little bit of a check-in and go, hey, are you oh, cool? Or did yeah, yeah. You, okay, no, we're good. So we're really good. No, I mean, Coach and I get along great. And I told him, I said, dude, this I'm a type A personality. And I said, I don't even know if you know this, but you are a type A personality and we're going to bang heads. But we, you know, we're good. Yeah, we're good. We talked it out. I mean, basically it was like, I looked at what John Feliciano did as 
being go, running to the defense of a teammate, which he was because Colton McKivitz was getting raked for for missing a block that didn't it wasn't Colton's fault. And then a lot of other people then raked Feliciano for burying his teammate Burford in public. And all I would say is just and I said this to him and and you, I've since heard John Lynch address it. It's like, it, you know, if you could really see how many real powerful disagreements there are in a football organization behind the scenes, you mm. would know that they'll, those guys will work that out. You know what I mean? They'll work yeah. that out. And so uh, a lot of people were like, oh, Feliciano's got to go or Burford's got to go. The reality is Feliciano's a great guy. Burford's a great guy. They'll They'll work it out. Feliciano shouldn't have thrown his teammate under the bus, but I understood it because to me it started with a good tra- a good act of trying to take you know the blame off of McKivitz. Um and coach and I, you know, we're looking at it from different perspectives. But yeah, no, we're good. We're good. We've we've talked it out. Well, we may not even still agree on it, um, but we've talked it out. Well, I'm I'm happy to hear that. I'm happy to hear that things were patched up because it was, hey, it was tremendous content. It was great content to see an argument that vigorous between two guys who really know their stuff and have contrasting perspectives. And also in the case of him, because he also he's a guy who has had some connection to football on the ground, not just from a media perspective, as you have. Um Knowing your stuff matters a lot, I think, when it comes to football. I keep quoting Nicholas Dawidoff. He wrote this book on the Jets that I found fascinating. It was maybe 10 years ago. And he was a very, uh, he was a New Yorker writer. And he embedded himself with the Rex Ryan Jets. And he said something like, is there anything Americans care more about and know less about than football? And there's really something to that, that there is this intense passion in this country, but there's so much that goes into the game. Most people watching on Sundays don't know what a scoop block is and don't know all these basics of it, but there's so much passion that the hunger to learn more is there. And they're not necessarily getting fed that when they're watching on Sundays or from the radio on the radio, maybe it's going to be this general question of, do you fire Shanahan or not? I mean, that's extreme, but you know what I'm saying? Is Shanahan a choker would be a radio question, right? There's this huge market, which I think you're serving of knowing a little something when you're talking about Rook Aurora And I hope I got that name. Correct. You did. I don't, I don't know what I'm looking at when I'm looking at a D lineman, a potential a potential draft choice and being able to differentiate what he's doing versus another guy. Frankly, it just all looks like guys mashed together from that side angle view. And I don't know how the responsibilities go. So I think what one thing you're doing is just you're you're bridging that divide between this hunger to know more and the information that just isn't accessible and you're bringing people to it. You know, the interesting thing, too, is that, like, take baseball, for example. Baseball is a sport where there's factors, but there's not endless factors. You know, if Gabe Kapler decides to pinch hit the left-hander, the left-handed hitter against a right-handed pitcher, you can quickly go look at what that hitter's hitting off that pitcher, what that hitter's hitting off of pitchers who throw from that side, what the hitter who he's pinch hitting for, you know, his numbers looked like. And you can, you know, have a pretty good idea if, you know, if that's a good decision or a bad decision. But people will always give the baseball manager like, well, you don't know. Well, yeah, that's true. The guy could have a hang nail. He could have told him in the tunnel Mm. that he's about to vomit. I mean, there's all kinds of things that could be going on. But as far as just like, you know, questioning your manager, there's there's plenty of opportunity to question the manager and people won't and they won't because they don't watch all 162 and they know they don't watch all 162. And so they're like, I don't know enough to question Boach. I don't know enough to question Melvin. I don't know enough to question Kapler. When in reality, you kind of do. And then you flip it over to football and People think, well, I've watched every preseason game and I've watched every minute of every regular Mm. season game. And thus, I know as much as Shanahan. And I can question, you know, what happens in practice. 
And all this is I, my job in the Canadian League was the defensive quality control job. It was the it's the job that was just basically I was the assistant linebacker coach, defensive quality control. So what did that mean? That's kind of the low man on the pole. That's what KJ Wright just signed on to be for the 49ers. That role took me into, you know, all of the game planning that goes into putting together the plan each week. And so much of that, after you get, let's say, four to eight weeks into the season, becomes also a self-scout. So, like, okay, this is what we do. This is our, here are our trends. And then if you got a good head coach, he wants to know what your opponent's trends are, but he also really wants to know after a couple months what our trends are. And so a lot of times, you know, there's there's factors that get into why coaches call certain plays, why coaches, you know, even have certain scripts in practice and training camp. I've seen coaches say to other coaches or coaches say to me, hey, Krug, I know you don't have anything out there, you know, uh, for this, but you know, this, I got one corner that won't cinch up his gloves until we get to the team. Can, can you, can we go at him and early on mm-hmm. in practice and try to get him focused? Yeah, we can do that. So we move the script around a little bit and now we're going, we're kind of, we're trying to test this one player or two. Now that's just, that's just a comment from an assistant coach to a quality control guy over a practice script and what play should be run. So then when we get to practice in July and people are sitting there and they're, and they're quoting it with stats. And I'm always like, I push back all the time, whether it be on Lombardi or Grant or anybody who's like, well, the stats show, well, you know what? It's meaningless. We're talking about Mm. practice stats and there's all kinds of factors that go into you know, why you do what you do at practice that have nothing to do with the how their pecking order, their depth chart, or how they view the players in relation to one another. So I just think that, you know, there's the old saying, if your premise is wrong, your conclusion's wrong. Well, if your premise is wrong, your conclusion is often wrong. And so I just think there's a lot of people who get off on faulty premises because they feel like they know everything because they've watched all the plays when in reality, there's so much more going on and they feel yeah. comfortable questioning Shanahan when in reality, you really shouldn't because there's just so many more factors than meets the eye. And I think that's one thing I do bring to the table is I kind of know what's important and what's not important. This was the big leap that I eventually made um, from it's it's ironic because I was at my most arrogant when I knew the least, I, I assumed I knew the most when I knew the least, because in a way it was easy to think that I came to the Warriors and they were very poorly run. And it was easy for me to just identify low hanging fruit of why are you guys doing this? Why are you guys doing that? But then they started to get good. And maybe Steve Kerr would do something that I would find questionable. And he might even have been wrong when he did it. But I had to make the journey to understanding that whatever happened was done for a reason. That a staff of people debated and considered and had a thought process behind. Now, they might be wrong. And I might identify why they're wrong. But if I don't know why they did it, I've got to figure out why they did what they did. That's what I need to do first. I can't just reflexively crush them and come at it from the perspective that these are fools. They're not fools. They know a lot more about what's happening behind the scenes in terms of personalities and just the basics. I mean, how many beat writers, and there aren't even beat writers anymore, how many people covering basketball teams not even just know the hand signals that are used when the coach throws up a hand signal, but even know that there's this thing called hand signals, right? Like there's a lot to the game that is just at a remove from people who are, as you were talking about, watching everything go down. So it's hard. I mean, Shanahan's not a god. He makes decisions that don't work out. He makes mistakes. But if you accept the premise that this is one of the better coaches 
I do think that it, it, the premise is better that there was a thought behind it, that if it's a wrong decision, it was a considered wrong decision. And then we can go from there and try to figure out maybe what should have happened otherwise. But probably we can't come at it from the perspective of this guy who works 100 hours a week is an idiot and isn't thinking at all about what he's doing. Right. It's like, you know what? You're right to wonder if something's going on there. You're wrong to take that that question and then come to the conclusion that this coach knows nothing. You know? Yeah. And and, I mean, and here's the other thing too. It's like if you really spent, you know, how many hours do any of us really spend? I mean, I I, I watch the game four times a week. Okay, so, but I'm watching it at least once on a kind of a condensed version. I'm watching once on an all 22 version. So the condensed version takes very little time. The, the, the all 22 takes three times as much time as a normal game. So it's like there's different impacts as far as how much time you're investing. But even so, I used to show up at the facility at quarter to five. And I used to leave the facility at like one o'clock in the morning. And we did this day after day after day. And nobody, not me, not Grant, not Lombardi, not anybody, nobody covering this team is spending even a fraction of that amount of time um, trying to figure out how to win. So you can ask questions and I can ask questions. And I've asked tough questions, but I don't ask them in a way that's like, you're a moron. I know more than you. Um, and um, and how could you not see it the way I see it? No, no, no. I give them so much more respect than that because I've done those jobs and I and I've rolled that tape back and I wear contact lenses and I've had my lenses subscription mm. strengthened four times in a season because I'm watching so much film. And I'm looking for incremental movement on the backside on tiny film. You know, I mean, it's like and and I've done it and I've sat there for hours and hours and hours and hours. And it's like when you've done that, you know, the difference between knowing what you knew then and knowing what you know now. And when you realize when you put the when you put those two things side by side. And you're now in my per, in my current spot. I don't get nearly as I know it all when I'm asking coaches and players questions because I yeah. know my commitment and I know theirs. Yeah. And I, that's why I started to approach it more from the perspective of, look, I'm the man from Mars. I don't know anything about anything. You know, can you fill me in? Can you explain this to me? Can you help me understand what's happening here? And that's when the guard comes down a little bit. They really don't like it when you come at it from the perspective of, I know why you're doing what you're doing. And I mean, this is a random one. I, I like Dan Patrick. I have no objection to Dan Patrick. Um, that's what you say before you're going to crush a guy. Right, uh, right. <laughs> I love Dan right Patrick. <laughs> I love Dan Patrick. But in the, in the Super Bowl aftermath, he was criticizing Shanahan and saying it seemed as though Shanahan wanted, I don't know, as some sort of feat to win the Super Bowl MVP for Brock Purdy. And that's why he went away from Christian McCaffrey. And I'm that's watching it and I'm talk. thinking, do you think he, like, do you think that thought even enters his mind when he's in that circumstance, the high adrenaline, his legacy, all the work everybody has done for that season just in those moments, they're thinking all these things that we wouldn't even begin to know about whatever Spag's defense is trying to do to them and what to do in response. And it's just some of the the ways people, uh, the things people come up with as an explanation for why things happen. Now, I do have a general take. I think Christian McCaffrey, who is an unimpeachable player and incredible, I thought he stopped breaking tackles after that fumble. I think that's very human. I think that's a very underrated storyline out of that Super Bowl, which is that he got 11 yards on the ground. But 
I think that's probably more of a, contrib- uh, a contributing factor that they weren't that successful on the ground to what was happening there than this idea that Kyle Shanahan is, I don't know, trying to win an MVP for one guy versus another guy out of intellectual peak or who knows what. Yeah, I mean, that's a credibility killer. I mean, it really is. I mean, I mean, I'm not to rip Patrick, but that's just a credibility killer right there. Um, I'll say this. I mean, to me, the area that I would criticize in that situation is you had a room full of talented backs and you mm. use Christian McCaffrey at a level this year. Yeah. That was crazy. I think the guy had roughly 400 and something touches and you had Elijah Mitchell right there and didn't use him. You had JP Mason right there. Didn't use him. You couldn't have used him in a cup. You couldn't have used these guys in a couple of other games. I mean, to me, the, the, the thing that I said or I many times earlier in the year was if the Niners get to the, to the Super Bowl and they don't have Christian McCaffrey on offense and Dre, Dre Greenlaw on defense, they're cooked. And mm. it kind of happened. You know, yeah. they got to the Super Bowl and they had McCaffrey at less than 100%, well, despite the fact they had unbelievable depth there. And Jalen Graham and D. Winters are really good young linebackers that could have played some snaps this year and probably should have. Uh, when Greenlaw, they should have protected Greenlaw from himself by sitting him out of a couple more games. Instead, you know, Greenlaw was cooked in the Super Bowl and and physically he wasn't the same player. Um, and it just that to me is, you know, where I'd be more critical of Shanahan than, you know, the idiocy yeah. of like, like he really cares who's the MVP at that point. No. It's like he he's so much more about about, you know, it, you know, selfish thoughts of how do I win this game for myself, let alone, you know, that's probably more accurate than, you know, his desire to get deliver hand deliver the MVP award to one player on his team as opposed to another. Uh, so, I mean, it's just, yeah, I mean, it's that it's things like that. It's like credible people that have been in the media forever who you want to give the benefit of the doubt to, but then say something that's so, so well, well off the truth that you're like, oh my God, that's embarrassing. Um, and that happens in football because we watch a lot of the games and we, everybody's, the camera shots are close ups of the quarterback and the head coach. And so the quarterback and the head coach are filibustered about at a level that, is 10 times that of other players. And then people feel the need to talk intelligently about the quarterback and the head coach. And then they just start making shit up. And that's really yeah. where it's at. Uh, it's that's where it's at. And it's one of the reasons why my immediate, when I, when I don't like a decision or don't understand a decision, I want to know why I think uh, Grant, has been very critical of Shanahan not using Jordan Mason because whenever Mason gets the ball, it seems like he gets chunks of, of yardage. I am, I've also been mystified by that, but my immediate assumption then is, well, what's going on behind the scenes with Mason that is informing that from Shanahan, right? Like there must be something behind the scenes. He fumbled maybe. a couple times in practice in July, you know, that's okay. probably has something to do with it. Um, okay. He may not know the sets and the and the the formations. He may be out of place more than a couple times in practice, which makes you think as a coach, I can't I can't trust him. I mean, there are things that could be going on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's not like there's no reason at all to play player A over player B or C. But all I'm saying is in your job is to coach up the team. If we're going to be, you know, if you get to the finish line and you don't have a healthy Christian McCaffrey and you didn't like Dallas has one back. His name's Tony Pollard. Everybody else on that team is like a total distant backup there. There's no chance that all those guys could start from from a scrimmage without the Cowboys just losing. So they're a one back team. okay? and there's a couple. of If you're a one back team and your one back gets tired late in the year. Well, I guess you got to blame the personnel department. But when you have four good backs and you your one back gets, gets overused and you get to the playoffs and he's not what he was, you know what? You didn't, you know, you, you got to, it's like a making a one starting pitcher make 50 starts and everybody else makes five. 
It's like, you know yeah. what? You got to balance it out a little bit. You got to, there's reasons. Could Steph Curry play? People talk about NBA rotations and, and Kerr's rotation with all this, like just play Steph more minutes. Okay. But there is a price that will be paid for that in May and June. If you want to run him out there in every big situation. And I've do streams with guys who are like, I don't care. Run them out there. Get some wins. You know, you be the five seed. Okay. But there's a chance you're going to get to the conference finals and he's going to be done. And is that, yeah. so you got to bring the whole thing along and that's, you know, um, and, and a lot of that's about the usage. So um, like I would like Jalen Graham, I'll give you an example for the Niners. Jalen Graham yeah. is a tremendous player. Jalen Graham is going, there's going to be, he's going to come of age and he's going to get games where he makes like 15 tackles, 12 tackles, 13 tackles. Right now, I asked Steve Wilkes, I'm like, Steve, where's Graham? Why are you guys not using Graham? And he's like, well, he played kind of a hybrid safety linebacker role. He's a little bit further behind. Okay, that's a good, that's, that's a good excuse. I mean, that's a, and that's a mm -hmm. real excuse, I should say. But um, you got to conquer that. What's going to happen is this guy's going to wind up playing this year. He's going to have a game where he has like 13, 14 tackles. And then the content creator world's going to be like, why didn't they use this guy last <laughs> year? Why didn't they, you know, they would have had a fresher green law if they had just played Graham. And I agree with that. I absolutely agree with that. But it's also about how ready was Graham? You know, whose assessment is that? Could they not get him ready? Um, I don't know. But he's going to play great ball and people are going to make that correlation. And they're going to be like, well, wait a second. Greenlaw ran out of gas. What if you had just played Graham? I don't know. You know, 10 plays a game in the second half through the second half of the year. Wouldn't that have made a healthy Greenlaw? And the answer is probably yes. Yeah. So, but it, you know, it's, it, it's, so hard. it's so hard though, because it's, I mean, there's a chance that Greenlaw plays that Super Bowl and he doesn't blow out his Achilles. And, you know, we don't think about any of these things and they, they win because of it, but they, they took a bet and they lost, right? They, they were really extending him. He was banged up. I don't think it's random. I don't think injuries are as there are random injuries where a guy tumbles into something, you know, Paul George snapping his leg in that game where he fell into the stanchion. Like there are random injuries, but not, not non-contact when you're running onto the field. That means you are overused and it means that you are overextended in the case of Greenlaw, by the way, for the listeners in case, uh, it wasn't clear. We have shifted to the 49ers portion and away from the uh, the media meta meta analysis. The thing about McCaffrey as being just so disproportionately used, and I think that I identify this as a problem more so because I grew up rooting for the Ladanian Tomlinson Chargers. Uh, Tomlinson was very similar to McCaffrey and also unimpeachable as a player. It's not a critique of him. I have deep reservations about when you build a team around the running back as just the the you know the son of your solar system. It just seems like you don't in this modern era tend to see the team with the greatest running back holding up the Lombardi trophy at the end. Something goes wrong. They get hurt or they get taken out of the action because you're behind and you need to throw to catch up. And that's one of the reasons why I think in general, they need to more widely distribute it, even if this guy is unimpeachable as a player and you can understand why Shanahan would want to use him every chance he gets. Well, and then, you know, the, the coaches determine who plays, but then there are certain players who kind of call their own shots. And I, to me, I, to me when in sports, I don't care if we're talking about Clay Thompson, Steph Curry, if we're talking about Christian McCaffrey, if we're talking about Buster Posey. You, players should only call their own shots in very unique situations. To give um, you know too much control to the players themselves is not is not wise. I think Kerr's overdone it. Um, Clay Thompson should have been coming off the bench months ago, months ago. Yeah. Um, but he didn't want to have that conversation with him. You know, um, Christian McCaffrey should have been out of the game several times. Uh, he, he probably played at least 
10 drives where it should have been Mitchell or Mason and it was him. And it's like, mm. and then was he a hundred percent in the Super Bowl? I don't know if he was or wasn't. Um, but you know, it's like that's giving the players total control. Um, I, I don't think is a good decision because yeah. they're always going to want to play. And that's part of being valued as a player is like, Hey man, this guy, every time we went to him, he wanted to play. Did he ever want to come out? No. Well, it, that's a great story and an anecdote in an article, but that does that help you win the championship? I mean, you got to get to the finish line with the bodies that you have. And um, I just, I would have loved to have seen Graham used more and Greenlaw be healthy for all four quarters. You saw the impact of what he did in the first half. And Patrick Mahomes was coming running off the field going, the, no. we, we got to dial up our intensity. We got to dial up mm. our intensity. Why? Because Greenlaw was bringing ridiculous intensity. And if he had been healthier, and I talked to him Thursday before the Super Bowl at one of the open media events in Vegas. And I said, Dre, and I've been talking to him all year, and he's a straight shooter. And I waited till all the rest of the media were out of there. And it was just me and him standing there. And I said, how you, how's your body feeling, man? How you, how you feeling going into this game? And I thought he would say, you know what? The extra week off, I'm feeling really good. I'm feeling refreshed. I'm, and he just was like, you know, kind of gave me the, the, mm -hmm. he didn't really, I mean, I kind of knew, you know, I got a, this guy's got a, a, an Achilles tendon that's dangling by a thread and he knows. Yeah. It. And he, he's, he's going to be out there and he's going full bore, but he ain't anywhere close to a hundred percent. And there's no Oof. amount of rest days. They're going to help, going to help him get to a hundred percent. He's injured. He's playing injured. He knows it. He's not going to use it as an excuse, but he's also not going to sit there and tell me I'm great. Krug, I'm great. I'm feeling great. No. And there were times this year when I went up to him after games. I'm like, dude, looked like you rolled the ankle pretty bad. And he was like, start jumping up and down on it and be like, ah, you know what? It feels pretty good. Feels pretty mm. good. And, you know, some, you know, so, or they're late in the year. I'm talking to him and he's like, yeah, you know, I just got a shot yesterday. So it's feeling better. So in other words, that's a pain killing shot to, you know, that's not a, make you better shot. That's just killing the pain and masking the pain. And, you know, there's an old saying, by the time you get to week 15 in the NFL, everybody's hurt. Tell me when you're injured. Well, mm. you know, that's really it. I mean, he was badly, badly hurt. And, um, so was Debo Samuel. There's a lot of people very critical of Debo Samuel. Debo Samuel was not, he, I walked by him in the locker room. He dropped something at his locker it was a somebody had shot a basketball and it was right there at the foot of his locker. And he kind of motioned towards me, like, can you get that? And it's like, I knew what he, I knew exactly what he was saying. He's like, dude, I'm that cool. beat up that I can't reach down and pick up a basketball and throw it to my teammate 15 feet away. You're standing right here. Could you do that for me? You know what I mean? It's like, so he was, he had bad shoulder. I don't know if it was a labrum tear, a, um, you know, what a rotator cuff, uh, broken bone. Uh, I don't know what it was. He didn't play the Green Bay game. He came out. Shanahan told me the next week. He's like, I said, what's the deal with the shoulder? What's the injury? Shanahan wouldn't tell me. He's like, it hurts. Yeah. So like, in other words, we're not telling you what it is. And so people who thought, oh, Debo played terrible in the Super Bowl. Yeah, that was Debo at far less than 100%. So you just, you know. Sometimes people look at these players and go, oh, they're getting old. Well, is he getting old or was he playing with a torn rotator cuff? You yeah. know, is yeah. Dre getting old or was Dre playing with a 85% torn um, Achilles? And, you know, so it's just football's different than the other sports. These guys are warriors. They go out there, they play hurt, they tape it up. They always have something. I've seen guys with terrible, terrible bone bruises. And I'm like, dude, that can't feel good. And he's like, oh, dude. I never talk about it, but it's the thing that hurts the most. You know, it's like hmm. you're not a, you're on the injury list for injury A and injury B, but injury C is causing you the most pain, and nobody knows anything about it because you're not on the injury list because they're trying to protect these guys from you know teams that are going to go at their injuries. So there's yeah. just a lot of factors here, man. That's just, you know what I mean? And injuries are a major part of football. It's hard because you don't want to lean on injuries as an excuse, and yet they're real and you got to work around them. Now, in the case of the NBA, 
a hard conversation like benching Clay. I think I think it's a more difficult NBA conversation than in the NFL taking away a guy's touches. And it just shows it shows the difference between the leagues. I think NFL, no matter the circumstance you're in, unless you are some incredible kind of diva, you're going full bore, full tilt when you're out there. The NBA, some of the conversations, you know, I had a friend of mine who um he he was in media, but he was so trusted and he was starting to retire. So they let him be around the coaches and the coaches meetings and to watch how it really goes down. He had that level of trust. And what he was most struck by, what he's told me, they talk about managing these players' personalities far more than he thought they might. They were going to send a guy to the bench and the fear is you would lose him completely. That's the NBA fear because you've got the guaranteed contracts. Maybe you've got some guys who are bigger guys. So maybe they don't love basketball, but they still provide some utility to you. And so it's not just a matter of, hey, go to the bench, you know, like go to the bench. Now you're off coming off the bench. You've got to baby them. You've got to really come up with a speech and get them to somehow buy in and not lose them, as they say. I think in the NFL, it's just more a circumstance where you're told what your role is and you're going to do your role. And that is how it is. The NBA is a, is, is a different universe in that capacity where there's a lot more personality management behind the scenes. And that's something that I don't think the fans always know about, that it's just not as easy as telling Clay this is your new job. You've got to tell Clay it's his new job and keep Clay and not have Clay just go off the, the deep end completely. I'm saying that hypothetically. I'm not saying that's what Clay would do, but just as a stand in, that is what some players do. Yeah. No, it makes sense. I mean, if you said to me, um, what's the genius of Steve Kerr? You know, cause I got a buddy out here in Walnut Creek that every time I talk to him, he wants to fire Kerr. I'm like, bro, there's, what about the parade? <laughs> Remember all the parades? And <laughs> he's like, well, oh, they got to fire him, man. Um, but Steve Kerr's greatest attribute is he brings the entire group along from Halloween on opening night or training camp in September through the end of the season. And in the NBA, I think the Warriors last title was came about because they stayed together as opposed to other teams that fractured in, you know, yeah. it's a cross country trip and you know, the way that works sometimes, if you love the people you're on the trip with, then you grow together and you bond and you get stronger as a group. If you hate the people you're with, or if there's some one bad guy in the room or whatever, you may absolutely hate it and you can't wait for the cross country trip to end. That's kind of like the NBA. I kind of feel like there were some teams in that year, the Warriors beat the Celtics that probably could have been, you know, viewed as more talented or better than Golden State. But those teams didn't grow together. They grew apart. Kerr to his test to, you know, testament to him keeps the group together. I think that was the greatness of Phil as well. And I think Steve viewed that and he understands that. You know, keeping the group together matters. And that means that sometimes you lie about things to the media and some, sometimes you uh, don't give full truths. And sometimes you say things to cover people. And um, sometimes you're you're sensitive to egos and you're, you know, I mean, it's like you got to bring, bring in the whole group from October mm. to June with the money, the pressure, the uh, the entourages, the people whispering in their ear, you're the man, you're the man, you're the man. I mean, it's a challenge. I would say, I would say it's probably it. the basketball part of it is the least of the challenge. It's much oh, more of the personalities. Oh, Steve would agree with you. Steve yeah. would say that's most of coaching is what he right. would say. I mean, he said that to me and I came, I came to believe that it mattered. And the funny thing about it is that Steve would manipulate and that's a harsh word to use for it because the manipulation is designed to get the most out of them. It's not manipulating in order to swindle them out of money, but he would manipulate these guys overtly, give them certain messaging to try to get something out of them. And the guys aren't dummies. They've been through AAU. These guys are pretty jaded. They know, they know what's going on, but the manipulation would still work. There's a funny thing to it where there's almost a respect to it. 
the coach is focusing on me and giving me this message because he wants this out of me. And yeah, I know he's working me in a way, but maybe I'm going to go along with it. And Steve was obsessed with finding these, these tricks of the trade when it came to that. And the interesting thing about him to sort of tie our worlds together a bit is the first thing he did before taking over the Warriors was to do this tour with NFL coaches and pick the brains of NFL coaches. Pete Carroll and, and others, yeah. Yeah, Pete Carroll most famously. And he pa he patterned a lot of what he did after how Pete Carroll did his practices. But he also, he also met with Bill Parcells. And one of the tricks of the trade that he got from Bill Parcells that now I use, I use it on my son. I think it's so <laughs> good. Uh, Parcells would have a, an underperforming player and he would call him into the office and he would say to the player, well, I guess I believe in you more than you do. I mean, that's what I'm seeing. You know, I, I believe that you can do this stuff, but you're not really showing me that you believe it. So I just think it's a tragedy. I think it's sad that I believe in you more than you believe in you. And what that does it allows you to coach the player hard and tell them that they're not up the snuff without killing the ego. It just becomes about, look, I, I think you're capable of this. You need to reach the level I know you can reach, but it's on you to get there. Steve loved stuff like that. And I think it's easy to dismiss that because you can't statistically analyze it as maybe it's all mythology and maybe it's all mumbo jumbo, but it's a lot of titles of that mumbo jumbo. I, I, I tended to believe in it at the end of the whole uh, journey I had, at least covering the team. I think this year, if you said, why are the Warriors in this kind of better spot um, than they were a few months ago? I, I think one of the key factors was the the death of their coach and and how mm. they bonded over that and how they, you know, found, you know, kind of common uh, ground and common kind of, you know, perspective. These are really, the one thing is these are really, really smart guys. You know what I mean? That's the thing. I mean, the pro athlete, what separates the pro athlete from the athlete that doesn't make it? Well, skill and talent, but a lot of times it's intellect and, and your yeah. smarts, the smartest players make it. And these are really, it's a really smart group of people. So you, you can't just be like, do it for Joe, do it for your money. Do it for me. Do it because I'm mad at you. It's like you have to find a source of inspiration. And, um, you know, I think I think the Warriors really grew um, together through that tragedy. Obviously, they 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 suffered a terrible loss. But yeah. it's like it also puts like everything more in perspective. Right. How can I be upset about my minute distribution? This guy was here and he's not here and his family's never going to be able to talk to him again. And you know, so I think that that uh, you know, this is why I told Steve. I, you know, I said, Steve, you could you could be the president of the United States if you wanted to. I mean, you, I'd vote for you, and I don't even care if I agreed with any of your politics. And it really just comes down to, I just think that you take the time to think through things, and I would want any leader um, to do the same. And I'm just so impressed by him. Now, through Tolbert, I've gotten a chance to know Steve a little bit and to do a number of interviews with him. Um, and I feel like I know what makes him tick. And I feel like I, I know enough about him as a player and Phil as a coach and his story, you know, coming from Arizona and, you know, what he did in the pros and what he's done as a coach enough to understand that, you know, he's so much about, he, he there's so, he's, he's a very deep character. And if you're, if you're trying to analyze him based on some, you know, rotation of minutes, you're missing the boat. Uh, and, I, and I understand what you're saying. I think somebody might, um, they might take the wrong implication from it. And they would say that, oh, you're saying that the coach dying was good. Like, no, that's not what you're saying. What you're no. saying is that it's a delicate thing to be the coach of a team in a circumstance like that and to actually get the team performing um, in the aftermath of a tragedy that makes the game seem irrelevant and you're paying a guy to do a job like that. It's not as simple as having 
the best ATOs. But yeah, there are always these factors behind the scenes that you couldn't even really fathom. Most of them, they won't even share to us. I believe when it comes to these teams and you're the media, there's almost this tier where they've got the stuff they're okay with everybody knowing. They've got the stuff they're not okay with everybody knowing, but you can know it. You're, you're, you're a trusted beat writer. You can know about it, but not everybody. And then they have the stuff that, oh shit, something really broke containment that you know about this. Somehow the people in these teams, I feel like they all have this just intrinsic sense of those three tiers. And there's a lot in that top tier that we never know about that matters tremendously. And it's a tough job to manage it all. It's it's really a difficult job. It's one of the reasons why you try to pay Bob Myers over $10 million a year to keep doing it from the general manager's role. And he goes, no, thanks. Uh, I'm out of here. It's, it's a lot in the NBA to manage. And I think um, in football, there's just more to manage schematically. But in the NBA, the personality, the personality clash, all of that, that's, that's what tends to wear on people and grind people up. And, and also Ray Ritter is just such a valuable guy for the Warriors. I mean, if you're going to, you got to have a, a, a PR director that can be endearing to the media people so that they feel like they're getting what they need. Their needs are being heeded and listened to, but, they're, you know, he's protecting the team on that high level. Um, and right, I don't know that I've ever come across any media person, relations person that ever did it any better than Ray Ritter. He makes you feel important. And even when you're not, he makes you feel he'll, he'll, he'll basically tell you that, you know, he can't tell you kind of a thing, <laughs> but he'll bring you along. So you're not just like, just out. It's like, you know, he'll find a way to tell you what's going on behind the scenes, but in a way so that you're not covering it. You know, he's just, I don't know. To me, yeah. he's the very, very best because, you know, it's very difficult to deal with the egos of the owners, the coaches, the players, right. the the media, the high level media who cover uh you know a particular sport, you know have their own they're almost like their own celebrities and and you know so it's like you're managed it's not just like beat writers and people writing for magazines it's like dude i'm a major television star making millions of dollars a year the players talk to me when they're not at the arena and i know this 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 and this and you're gonna i want you know so he's got to somehow corral the whole thing and make it healthy and work and yeah uh it's, he's the bad he is the very very best at doing it in my I have this fun i had this funny uh situation where I remember we were in Dallas and I was in the media room and Joe Lacob was getting a media meal and I'm talking to Joe and Raymond knows that Joe is a loose cannon. And even if Joe is his boss, he needs to protect his boss from himself. So I'm talking to Joe and Raymond just pops up out of nowhere like, okay, okay, here you go. We got the meal ticket for you. And oh, Ethan, what are you doing here? Oh, how are things going out? And Joe kind of breaks the fourth wall of the situation and goes, you know, you see that? He 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 knows I don't need a meal ticket. He's just worried about what I'm going to say to you. That's why that's why I didn't fire this guy. <laughs> then yeah. Raymond nervously laughs and uh, he takes on so much as the uh, media relations impresario. It's funny. I was, just, um, I was just at the facility, not in the media capacity. I took my kindergartner there just to sort of show him just this is the basketball world and i had to explain what raymond ritter was to a kindergartner it's just an interesting like i could explain the, the the star of the team i can explain the coach of the team he said oh so he's like the parent and i said yeah the players probably wouldn't like that kind of framing but you could say that steve's like the you know <laughs> he's right, telling right. them what to do and what not to do like a parent um raymond i think i said 
he his job is to make sure people hear good things about the team. That's what I that's how I explained it. And then my son responded uh, with Raymond right in front of us. Why are you bald? Or he said something like that. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. yeah no, to I which, mean, to which Raymond say? went. He, he took it in good. He was like, oh, I'm bald. Wait, are you telling me I'm bald? No way. And, you know, my son got a good <laughs> kick out of that. And then, uh, you know, is uh, then Raymond said that uh, some girls like it. And then my son had all kinds of questions about that. But oh, yeah. we're getting very far afield. I do wonder if they need to approach, and this is what we'll end on. We've had a very long conversation. You, as we've said, work tremendously hard. I do wonder if they have to approach how they do media a bit differently in that building because I was there in a non media capacity. I feel like I have retired as a Warriors, whatever, for the most part. But there were very few people there. It was fewer people than would have been there in 2013 at the old Oakland facility. And that was before the four championships. I know they're on the play in track, but they still have Steph Curry and Draymond and Clay and Steve. And I think that there's just this problem, Larry. This is a very prosaic issue they got going where it's hard to get there, it's hard to park. Um, if you're covering the Niners, you just roll up and you park and you go inside. If you're going to the San Francisco spot for the Warriors, maybe you can find a parking garage and pay through the nose or you just circle blocks and blocks and blocks for 15 minutes and then walk another 15. And the new facility is kind of at a remove from the media. They liked that. They wanted that, that you weren't really mingling with the players. But I feel like they're just not... They're not a topic in in the community, in the Bay, like I feel they should be at a certain level. I think they need to do something else or do something extra because it's almost like what they do is meant for a time that's not right now. They hold press conferences during their practice that is a walk away from the facility. So you've got to make a choice to be at the practice or to be at the press conference. And there might be some years where they're not a press conference level team. So that's just the thought I'm throwing out there. You might have a better perspective because you're you're not in it. You're sort of like covering all the sports and you know how they're rate and relative. Do you feel like the Warriors energy needs to come up right now as the football is out and we're going down the stretch of the season? Um, I, you know, it's such a great point. I, I do agree. It's not something that I've noticed because I, because of the difficulty in the whole process of parking, getting there, um, I, I, I don't wind up going hardly ever, if at a, if ever. Um, and I just kind of cover it from afar. And I do agree. I also think their tiers, you know, where they have like three people that are in this certain tier and they're all people that are like, have some kind of, they have some kind of financial control over. So like, you mm. know, it's like the radio station guy, the television station guy, and like one or two writers, it's like those people are in like the tier one. And then like the guys who may ask some tougher questions never really get, you know, like Cyrus Satsis, who's on the locked on warriors. He's very passionate. And yet he can never really interview Kerr uh, or ever really interview any players. And then like you'll, you'll talk to, you know, the Raymond and, and he'll be like, yeah, you know, come out. I can get you somebody, but it will never be Draymond. And it will never mm. be Steph and it will never be Clay. And it's like, okay, I, I mean, I get it and I don't really care. And as I told you before, I don't want anybody on my channel that doesn't want to be on my channel. So, but it, but it's kind of sends a message like we, none of those guys want to be on. And then it's like, okay, well, that's fine. But it, it kind of, it's hard to have that, um, you know, don't talk about this story. Don't talk about that story when you're already kind of acing everybody out. Then it just kind of becomes, it kind of suggests that it's like every man for himself. And then I yeah. think people just kind of, you just kind of get the brunt of it, you know? Um, and I, I, I could say things that are incredibly critical of the warriors on my, on my YouTube channel and probably never hear anything about it. But if I fill in on 95, seven, the game and I say something wrong about how much, cap room they may have in the off season, 
I may get a call from Raymond saying, hey, Joe mm-hmm. heard that and didn't like it. And mm-hmm. could you correct mm-hmm. that? And it's like, yeah. okay, now you're, you're kind of micromanaging me. You're telling me, you know, what to say, what not to say. And that's fine if I'm wrong, but you're, there's no payout to that. It's not like, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, you know, I did that for you. And next week you're getting me Clay Thompson. Or I did that for you, and next week I'm going to get Draymond Green. It's like, no, no, only Stephen A. Smith is going to get Draymond Green, or only Michael Wilbon's going to get Steve Kerr, or only the radio station's going to, you know. So they're, it's it's great to have exclusivity, but they may be getting a little too exclusive. Yeah, I think they might they might have to adjust. They might have to adjust the strategy and location as part of it. And their location, I think, is ideal for when they're winning the championship. But we'll see. We'll Okay, we'll end on this right here. Give the Niners fans a little something more, which is I, I've been listening to all this coverage of the draft that you do. Yeah. I want I want your draft pick, your first rounder, that just if you could have your druthers, and we're not going to talk like, top five but like a guy like a guy where oh my god i can't believe that he slipped uh and a guy where he actually might be realistically there i want those two from you as your ideal draft pick for the 49ers to go out on um you know jc latham would be the guy that i from the alabama offensive right tackle that i would be like i can't believe he slipped uh, I don't mm. believe he will slip. I think he's probably going to go in the top 10, but you never know. And there's always these workouts and who knows uh, this guy's six, six, 335 pounds. He wears number 65 for Alabama. He's their right tackle. He's a blue chip plug and play guy that you're going to be able to day one. He's going to start at right tackle and he's going to start at right tackle for the next decade. So that would be like, you know, if you could get that guy, That kind of, that's like your number one need and a big time guy who's a blue chipper falls right into your lap. Um, I think if it was me, um, I I like um, the guy you named before, Rook or, 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 or row, or row, or row. It's or (laughs) row, row, row. That's what it, or row, row, row. Um, It's O-R-H-O-R-H-O-R-O. Uh, but anyway, he's a Clemson defensive lineman. He wore number 33 or 32 for Clemson this year, and he's 295 pounds. And if you watch him work out, he looks like he's moving around like a linebacker. Um, he was an all ACC player. I mean, the, the guy is really a tremendous player. And you just don't when you see a guy who's 295 and you look at him and you're like, wow, that guy looks like he's 270. Um, mm. That means he's really special. And not only is this guy a great athlete and played in a big time conference, he was he was all ACC, uh, but he was all all ACC academic as well. So you're talking about a guy who's really, really smart, um, who's really, really athletic um, and he's earned his degree already. He's working on a master's, um, you know, he's a two time ACC honor roll selection. Uh, he's just, he's a tremendous player. He really is. And, and right now he's not being thought of that highly just because there are other guys and, but his workout numbers were incredible. His production was incredible. And, you know, we're talking about a 300 pounder that could be a great pass rusher and dominant against the run. So I'll say Rook, a row, row, row. I think you're getting some insight people into the way Larry views the game. It is in the trenches. Uh, it is based on the foundation. You can correct me if I'm wrong on that one. Um, who would it be for me? Nobody cares about my football opinions. I guess if something crazy happened, uh, Ladu, Ladu, however you pronounce his name out of UCLA. UCLA. Yeah, yeah. That guy is not going to be available to the Niners, but he's got a scary injury history. So maybe somebody behind the scenes, there's some sort of, or maybe, I don't know, they trade Ayuk and they get into the mid round. But I feel like that guy, unless injury is uh, something that derails him just on the basis of his play, I just feel like that guy is going to be a star. Um, When I see a defense... When I see a defensive end uh, or an edge rusher who not only has the double digit sacks, but also gets two interceptions, that's usually an indicator of a pretty special athlete. So that guy, 
is kind of a, a dream selection. And then unlike you, I like, I like the bells and whistles. I, you know, I, I want them to have uh, a receiver uh, who actually scares uh, spags. Um, and I, I like, Hey man, maybe I just like pac 12 guys. I was more, uh, I was almost intrigued further by Troy Franklin for having such a bad combine that it made me go, ha, huh, he's going to fall. Okay. That's good. Because I, I generally care more about a guy's production, uh, than what they do in these various weird drills that they set up. You can tell me I'm an idiot and the drills matter. I don't know, but I like, I like him. So those are my two selections and I put in about, Oh, I don't know a thousandth of the, uh, the man hours that, that Larry does when it comes to investigating all of this. So you could take that with a massive grain of salt. Troy Franklin, huh? Troy Franklin. Is that who it is? Yeah. 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 My only concern is that, um, pack 12 receivers have everything going in their favor. The mm. game is called very tight. It's played in good weather. It's usually with pro style coaches, pro style offenses and great future NFL quarterbacks. So I think oftentimes like it's very, there's lots of PAC 12 receivers, whether you're going Dante Pettis or Sean Dawkins or what, who just for whatever reason um, fall short of expectations because everything I mean, favors the receiver in the PAC 12. Uh, but that being said, I do like Jerry Rice's kid, Brendan Rice quite a bit. And yeah, um, and I, I would love to see Brendan Rice um, playing for the 49ers. But some of those top-tier Pac-12 guys make me nervous this year. Roma Dunze, uh, mm. Troy Franklin. Um, I'm a little nervous. Jalen Polk. Um, all of the Pac-12 receivers. Jalen McMillan. Um, I'm a little concerned about the Pac-12 receivers. The, receiver, the two receivers I love in this draft, I love... Uh, Xavier Leggett. Yeah, I was about to. Say, I was about to say, what are we doing, Larry? Are we going Leggett second round? You know, we're I not going Leggett. Troy Franklin. I mean, he's two thirty. He's two hundred thirty pounds, and he ran the four threes. And if you yeah. watch him, he's amazing. And then he Brian Thomas off the film. Yeah. The LSU LSU gets a lot of great players, and both the LSU receivers, Malik Neighbors and and Brian Thomas Jr are special. I mean, really special. Like if, if people talk about, well, should the Niners move Ayuk? I wouldn't move Ayuk, but you know what? If somehow I could wind up with moving Ayuk, getting a top tier tackle like a JC Latham and still coming away with Brian Thomas, I would do it because I think there's a chance that Thomas is better than Ayuk. Um, mm. So, so there you go. That's, that's, those would be my guys. And I kind of like Malachi Corley as well from Western Kentucky. Yeah. That reminds me of, Reminds me a little bit of a Debo Samuel and I'm the other receiver that I'm super hot to trot on right now is a slot receiver and slot receivers are generally smaller They're You know, they run inside, but there's a kid named Malik Washington who played mm -hmm. for university of Virginia this year. Who's like Tyree kill size. He's like five, eight, one ninety five. But I mean, if the, the production this kid started at Northwestern. He transferred to UVA. The production of this guy. I mean, I mean, this guy went for just huge numbers all year long. Um, Malik Washington, really tremendous yeah. little player. There you go. Larry does his homework. Uh, I'm intrigued by Malachi Corley. He didn't really uh, do the combine stuff. I, I, I like knowing the 40 times just for my own curiosity. I would have wanted to know it for him. Uh, but yeah, he's the yak king as Steve Smith said it in college football and has some great highlights. Leggett you mentioned is somebody where his highlights, he just looks like he's running away from people. Now, I don't know why this is his only productive year he's had. This is the sort of thing. Again, it's the behind the scenes, like what sort of, what sort of, uh, investigative work are you going to turn up there? Uh, I got to check out Washington. There's a whole other conversation, Larry, about how much receivers matter. There are so many great ones. The Chiefs won a Super Bowl without really investing in receivers. But that's for another time, another conversation. Uh, Larry, thanks so much. Congratulations. We wish you continued success. Uh, you, you make a tremendous effort uh, to keep the people happy. We say at the end of these things, promote 
uh, in the outro, which you got to promote. I, I have a, you know, an inkling what you might want to plug for us on the way out of here. <laughs> What's that? What are we going to promote? Oh, Pig in a Pickle. I mean, that's the... Well, of course, yeah, of course, our sponsors, <laughs> Pig in a Pickle, the title sponsor of the Krug Show, um, you know, very loyal to me. They they left KMBR and came with me um, to YouTube, um, as did Marin Autoglass, my my good friend Saeed Ravenfar, uh, Ravenfar, I should say, is, is a great guy, and he came with me as well, left KMBR. So, you know, great sponsors. Um Got a new deal cooking up here in the next few weeks with Mancini's Sleep World. I'm really excited to be partnered with them. Um, we're going to do great things for Mancini's. And um, I just want to thank all the people more than anything. And my son, you know, my son is a college student and he's a senior in college. He's got a girlfriend. He's got a life. Uh, he's in a fraternity. He's got he's a construction management major and he still runs my channel um, as well as manages me and kind of motivates me. And uh, so nobody deserves more praise in this thing than Kevin Kruger, my son, my oldest son. Uh, and I love him to death. And and um, and I just love doing what we're doing. So, you know, it's, um, it's really a lot of fun. I'll do a call-in show tonight um, with the audience and him around 7 o'clock and tune in for that. And um, one of our listeners, uh, Ethan, took us to the Golden Steer in Vegas, this steakhouse. Um, big, he, a guy goes by Big Mo Easy on the show. He does the call-in show. He'll call in tonight. And I didn't realize that it was like such a tough place to get a reservation. Mm. We went to dinner there in Vegas. And then I was talking to JT the Brick and a couple other people who were like, you know, people that know Vegas really well. And they're like, yeah, so you, what have you been doing? I said, oh, yeah, we went to the Golden Steer. How'd you get into that place? Mm. And that, you know, you got to have a, you know, a, res a reservation a year in advance. And, um, you know, we ran into, I, dude, I ran into Wayne Newton. One, huh. of the vi one of the videos I did with Damon Bruce from Las Vegas, Wayne Newton makes an appearance in our video. Um, mm. But, yeah, it, it was just the fact that, you know, some of our listeners are so big fans that they're like, would take us out to dinner at the Golden Steer, and you know, you know, I don't know how the guy got the reservation, but um, stuff like that is just really, really cool. So I'm having yeah. fun. I hope people can see that we're having fun. Um, you know, if the Warriors get hot and they go to the playoffs, we'll come on after every Warrior game. Um, if they don't, if they just kind of stay mediocre, we'll pick and choose some games. I'll do the same thing with the Giants if they get hot. I'll come on after their games. The Niners were full bore in on because that's kind of the thrust of the channel, but that's it right there. And I hope everybody who's catching our content knows that um, I'm in this for the right reasons. I just want to, I just want to have fun. I want to talk. I want to talk sport, Bay area sports. I don't want to be filtered. I want to talk to the audience and I want to make enough money to, um, yeah. to support my family. And I've got three kids in college and, that's my motivation. So I'm loving it. And I appreciate guys like yourself for, for reaching out to me. And I'd love to have you on the Krug show. You know, my son, oh. Kevin was like, see if Ethan can come on with us. And I'm like, Oh yeah, we will. We'll work it out. So yeah. Um, no, yeah. I'm appreciate in. you, man. No, it's just, I'm in, I'm down to do it. What you said earlier that we didn't even return to really resonated with me when you were making less money than you made for the radio show, but they couldn't recruit you because when you're making your own money, on your own platform, that money counts for more. It just does. It's independence, it's security on a whole other level, a level that when you've been doing this kind of job in the media, you've never really felt before. And it allows you to do not only great work, but the exact kind of great work that you want to do, which is what you're doing. Larry, thanks so much for coming on. Ethan, thanks for having me. Appreciate you.